uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the two eminent speakers who are with me. The first is uh, Dr. Tejas Bari, who is a consultant at the Saint Dr. Grace Hospital, Scotland. Um, and my association with him started uh, during his St. John's days. And uh, the next is Dr. Rakesh Garg, uh, who is my close friend. Uh, and uh, we did post-graduation together in Delhi. And uh, somebody who's very dear to me, and uh, he doesn't need any introduction in the anesthesia circles in India. And uh, the first talk uh, will be by Dr. Tejas Bari, who will talk about uh, the evolution of uh, laryngeal mask airway. Uh, the second of the talk will be by me. Uh, I will talk about the role of airway in difficult airway. Third will be by Dr. Rakesh, uh, who, who I think is the best person to deal with the next talk, that is the evolving role and controversies, because we may have, uh, as the roles are evolving, we'll have more and more doubts. And uh, there is no one other than uh, Dr. Rakesh who can tell us about the evidence for each of these. And uh, there are a few up, uh, newer gadgets which have come. I'll just have a brief session on those, and uh, then we'll move on to the um, QA and the session. So we Hello? Sorry, sorry. Okay, Tejas, you can go ahead. Can, can I start? Okay, sorry, I, I seem to have lost it. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so um, I believe everybody can see my screen now. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Um, and first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, many thanks for uh, inviting me to speak on this webinar. And also congratulations to the ICA. Uh, for We have just heard that uh, you're uh, recent, uh, about to complete 100 webinars. So that's a fantastic job. Right. Now coming to the topic, um, laryngeal mask airways. You know, my topic, uh, my part of the topic is to speak about the evolution of laryngeal mask airways. When we talk about history of anesthesia, you think of the big things, you think of the first demonstration of anesthesia or regional anesthesia or so many things. But, but really, we, are, we have all been privileged uh, to be witnessing a huge uh, historical event during our own careers and during our own lifetimes. Um, and the LMA is one such story. And like Balkrishna sir said, uh, the introduction of the LMA has really revolutionized the practice of anesthetics. Okay? So let's start, let's rewind uh, just a few decades to the late 70s, early 80s, right? And the hero for this story is Dr. Archie Brain. And Dr. Archie Brain was a, a British anesthetist who at the time was working for a period of time in a small island off the coast of Africa called Seychelles. Those days, when you said a general anesthetic, you only had very limited choices. If it was a short case, and when you say short, even up to an hour was considered short, perhaps. And if it's relatively uncomplicated, you could just hold a mask. If for anything else, you would have to put a tube down the trachea. And they didn't really have the wide variety of choices that we have today. And, what, and during his placement over there, he came across a couple of difficult airway cases, which got him thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, which got him thinking that there must be something that we can do to make this situation better. Okay. Right, back to London in 1981, while attending a lecture, he made some notes and he was a person who was constantly thinking about innovations, about changing things and making, putting things together. Um, and, and an excerpt from his own diary, it says a ring fitting around the larynx may do it. And, and he makes a note to himself to make a plaster cast of the larynx first. So that's what he went ahead and did. He took plaster of Paris and made a mold or a cast of it from a cadaver. And this is what it came out as. And this shape today looks so familiar to us, but that time, this was something which nobody had imagined or seen. 
And as coincidence would have it, those days he was doing dental anesthetics. For dental anesthetics, what they used to do was they used to use something called a Goldman mask. It's a small mask which would, was designed to fit around the nose and the dentist could work in the mouth. So Dr. Brain observed that this mask shape was very similar to the larynx cast that he had made. So he set about to work. He took one of those Goldman masks, took it apart, and then stitched it together with a tube. And lo and behold, the first prototype of the laryngeal mask airway was done. And this is currently displayed in a museum at the Association of Anesthetists in London. He made this mask and for a few, for a little while, he wasn't sure what to do. I mean, he wasn't, it was something so new. And after about five or six weeks, one day while doing a relatively simple anesthetic, he thought, why not try it? So when the patient was asleep and he was holding a mask, so he put, slipped this mask in and he saw that it was fairly easy to put in. Not only was it easy, the patient was breathing very comfortably, spontaneously, no obstruction, and his hands were free. So this got him really excited. And then he went about making a number of these prototypes and tried it in a series of patients and then tried to publish it. And guess what? Weird, monstrous looking black substance, such huge thing to put into somebody's throat. Initially, when nobody, there were no takers. The initial manuscript was rejected. He was convinced that it was a really soft and it wasn't, it was a gentle thing. So to, in a way to prove it, what he did was he went down to the photography department. They didn't have mobiles or other things. And it was, it was a process to get things, get yourself photographed those days. So he went down to his photography department, took his device, sprayed his own throat, and then put it in. A little bit of coughing, spluttering, but then he was able to breathe comfortably through it awake. And, and, and that, unfortunately, we have lost the original photo with where he had it already in his mouth, but this, these are original photos from that photo shoot. Okay. Next, he set about trying to see if he can find a different material, something soft and pliant with which he could design his new masks. And he chose latex. So he could make the latex mold and then dipping the mold in, to, in the latex, he could make little latex masks. And after a series of experiments and other things, he designed his little airway, but now he wanted somebody who can manufacture it. This is taking it one step further, not quite marketed, but just to make the device. And at, this is where I enter Dunlop. Dunlop, you're all familiar with this name. They are very famous for their tires and rubber things. And at that time, Dunlop was making some kind of lining material for airline doors. And they also had a small medical department. So he went with his model to Dunlop. They knew nothing about larynxes or laryngeal airways or and nobody knew anything about that. He asked them whether he can do this design for me in silicone. And they came up with this. And it looks like an LMA, but it's not really an LMA, is it? So after this, they gave him some 100 pieces of this prototype and he had to make his own machine and painstakingly with his hands cut and make the first Dunlop prototype. And now this looks quite familiar to us. It's beginning to look more like the classic LMA that we are all familiar with. Okay. Next, he took this to one of the eminent anesthetists at that time, Dr. Nunn, and explained about this to him and gave him a few prototypes and said, why don't you try it? Dr. Nunn then took a group of 18 anesthetists and none of them were trained in insertion of LMAs. None of them had seen anything like this, but they all said, why not we give it a try? They put it in 100 patients and they had fantastic success. They had 98% success in managing an airway. And they knew then that they had something revolutionary on their hands. And this photo nicely illustrates how the LMA first evolved from a little Goldman cuff to a latex cuff to a Dunlop cuff, eventually coming to the classic LMA. And this was the first publication, uh, which was tried on 100 patients. But it's one thing to make a new device. As an inventor, you're thinking how to make it soft, how to make it work, what are the problems. But when you want to manufacture it and sell it, then it's a completely different idea. The manufacturer wants other things. They want to know how much it's going to cost. What's in it for the company? Can we make a profit? Do, are there enough people who want to buy this thing? And initially, it was very difficult. Nobody was interested in making these LMAs. Back to Seychelles, and he found a Mr. Robert Gaines Cooper. 
This was a businessman. He asked him a few questions. He was on the lookout for a new business and he wanted something to do with the export style business. Is this something that a lot of people are likely to want? Yes. Is it something that we can export? Yes. Well, and lo and behold, the classic LMA company was born. Okay. And this was the first LMA classic that they came about. And you know, from there on, it's all a part of history. Within this is data from one particular hospital and within a very short period of time from introduction of LMA, you can see that the use of LMA from uh, started out becoming more than the use of endotracheal tubes within a period of less than like two, three years. Okay. But it wasn't easy. Let's go a little, dig a little bit deeper into how this design evolved, right? If you look at a picture of the top of the larynx, it's a very complex structure. The base of the tongue, um, we as anesthetists are in a way very familiar with part of this view, but to design something which is going to go and sit on top of it and give you a good seal and not get obstructed and do a lot of other things that you want it to do is not a simple task. And on top of that, this is a drawing that I had drawn years ago from a book. I call it the many faces of a difficult airway. Not all people are similar. Everybody's larynxes look different. Every the different sizes, different shapes. And to make a device which is going to work, it, it definitely not in all, but even to work in most people, you can begin to see the complexity of the job on hand. Another analogy is the flower and stem analogy. You take a lot of different diff flowers, lovely, beautiful, different shapes and different colors. But if you look at their stems, most of them, this is simple, straight, tubular structure. Similarly, most people's tracheas have a similar structure, slightly bigger, slightly smaller, but mostly D-shaped. If you can manage to get a tube into the trachea and a cuff around it, you will be able to get a seal. But on the other hand, if you're trying to make something which is going to sit on what's at the top, the larynx, and to get a good seal around it, you can see how difficult it is going to be. The ideal laryngeal mask should have a lot of features. It should be easy to insert. It should be gentle. It, you should be able to get a good seal. You should avoid the epiglottis blocking things. You should get gastric relief. Maybe you don't want to intubate through it. So to get all of these things, it takes a lot of work and a lot of thought. And the inventor's mind goes through a lot of processes. For example, um, what to do with gastric drainage? Should I put a tube there? Does it look too sharp? Or maybe this is too traumatic? Oh, maybe I should make it blunt. I wonder if this works. I wonder if that works, so on and so forth. And eventually Dr. Brain went through hundreds of prototypes. He, this over years, he had so much dedication, so much passion for this, that he spent so much of time designing so many of these things. Not only did he design them, he evaluated them, made his own scoring system, made notes about each of them, accepting what is good and discarding what looks too outlandish or what's not going to work, eventually coming out from his designs, they were further able to come out with many more LMAs. So it's the same classic LMA, a flexible LMA has a flexible stem, which was specifically designed for ENT purposes. Now, any blood or secretions that comes backwards can settle on top of the LMA and the tube being flexible can be moved about by the surgeon without dislodging the actual mask they designed the intubating LMA, a specific shape um, made to, to make blind intubation through the LMA easy, an epiglottic elevating bar, so on. The LMA ProSeal then came. This was designed primarily to address the problem of gastric inflation, but also to achieve higher seal pressure and also claim to achieve better patient comfort. And the LMA Supreme was the disposable version of the LMA Pro Seal, which was made with a large plastic cuff. Um, and then the pharyngeal seal and intermediate between the classic LMA and the Pro Seal LMA. But these models only represent a small fraction of the potentially useful designs that have originated from his research. Now, no story is fully complete without the entry of the villain. So let's see who the villain is. So somewhere in the late 80s, somewhere in, in that time, early 90s, came about this thing, the mad cow disease or the prion disease. It's transmitted by something called prion, some protein particle, not a virus, not a bacteria. But the thing is, these prions 
potentially are located in that lymphatic ring around where we place our airway gadgets. And that meant that most of the anesthetic gadgets that we put into the mouth started becoming disposable. Disposable mask, disposable laryngoscope blades, and the LMA soon had to follow suit. Now, remember, initially there were no takers. Nobody wanted to manufacture this device. But now that it had already become popular, there were plenty of people who wanted to manufacture it. There was money involved. And at about around the same time, the patent for the classic LMA started coming off. And that means other people could copy this design. And there were many people, many other companies who, come out, who could come out with LMAs. Okay. So much so that we started getting more and more devices and further improvements on the devices that we now need a classification. There are different classifications. I'll give you two of them. One is based on the sealing mechanism. Okay. With this, they classify them as cuffed perilaryngeal sealers. This includes examples like the classic LMA, which has got a seal around the larynx. You have cuffed peripharyngeal sealers. When I show the picture, you will understand a bit better. And you have cuffless anatomically shaped sealers. So the perilaryngeal sealers are the LMA-like things which seal around the larynx. The peripharyngeal sealers are tubes like this, which has got a big cuff, which is not sealing around the larynx, but above the larynx. And then you have the cuffless devices, which are anatomically pre-shaped to fit around the larynx. Another classification, which is more popular, is the first generation, second generation, and a proposed third generation. The first generation, simple breathing tube, examples including classic LMA, the LMA unique, et cetera. The second generation is the above plus anything which has got provision for gastric drainage and improved protection against aspiration. So this is the most recommended kind of <coughs> supraglottic airway that most of us are using these days. The proposed third generation is a dynamic sealing mechanism. Here, the pressure, the sealing pressure is dependent on the airway pressure. And I'll come, I'll explain about that a little later when I speak about uh, the slipper and the Basca mask. But in practice, when we pick up an LMA, we want to know, is it quick and easy? Is it going to seal well? Is it going to protect against aspiration? But mainly we want to know, is it suitable fit for purpose? Meaning, is it suitable for the kind of case that I'm going to do for the purpose that I want it to work? Let's go back to the design and some of the issues with LMAs. There are plenty of potential problems with LMS. This list is by no means a complete list, but I just want to elaborate on a few of these things just to give you an idea of how complex it is to design and evolve this supraglottic airway and how far we have come down this road. First of all, the epiglottis. Epiglottis is a short little leaf-like uh, <coughs> cartilaginous structure present at the base of the tongue. Physiologically, it is meant to close the airway and protect the airway when you are swallowing. But when you try to put an LMA in, in that direction, it is quite possible to push the epiglottis downwards as you insert it, and that might block the airway. Or even if it stays in the place where it is, this might enter the tube of your LMA and therefore it might block it. And while designing the first few LMAs, this was quite a vexing issue. So Dr. Brain's research, if you look at it, he found that if the LMA was a bit thicker, there was a higher chance that it's going to push this epiglottis down. And therefore, if you make it thinner and more wedge shaped, you may be able to slip it behind the epiglottis without pushing it down. But this is only one idea. But thing is, when you make a thinner LMA, there is a bigger chance that it may curve on itself and block itself. So you see how, how things progress. So he then designed something else. He thought maybe he can put in an introducer. And in this particular introducer, which apparently was never used in any patient, uh, it's a metal thing meant to keep this thinner LMA stiff and is put in a little knob at the end. So the idea was when you retract the metal introducer, it pulls the epiglottis back in place. But perhaps he felt that this was too traumatic to the epiglottis. So he never really tried this particular invention. Then he thought, maybe if you can devise some kind of mechanism which can push the epiglottis away, uh, he tried putting balloons within the bowel of the LMA, which you can inflate to try and push the epiglottis away. And, and this idea is further explored in some of the other devices as well. 
and so on and so forth. And gradually, this led to the creation of the epiglottic bars as we know it. And this is how the classic LMA finally came about. The interesting thing here is when the patent for the classic LMA ran out, the patent for these epiglottic bars was apparently separate. So although other companies could manufacture LMAs, they couldn't put the epiglottic bars in. Another concept is if you make the bowel a bit deeper, then you could avoid the epiglottis coming in the way. So if you look at the early AMBU LMA, for example, the AMBU straight, I mean, it looks very similar to the classic LMA, but it's a bit deeper and there are no epiglottic bars. Next, let us look at airway protection. And there are many physiological mechanisms which are meant to stop the gastric acid from coming up towards the airway. Now let's concentrate at the top end. We have the upper esophageal sphincter and in case there is any regurgitation or any acid coming up, it is meant to constrict and it, it normally stays constricted and it's meant to stop this from coming up towards the airway. However, physiologically, if you swallow a bolus of food, when the bolus of food reaches up from above, anything that tries to enter from above solid stuff, the sphincter is designed to open. And now you can see what's going to happen. When you put an LMA and the tip of it is forced into the upper esophageal sphincter, the more you push it to get a seal, the more it's likely to relax and open. And if you have a reflux, this potentially becomes a problem. This is one of the most vexing problems, which for a long time prevented us using it for long duration cases, laparoscopy and so on and so forth. So what is the way around it? There have been different approaches. Different people have taken different approaches to this. One of the first things that came about was the LMA Pro Seal. This again came about after lots of other prototypes and so many things. The idea is that by putting in a second tube, if there is a reflux, you can allow EC exit for those reflux contents. So that's where it starts. Not only that, this LMA also included a few other features. It had a deliberately elongated cuff. So they made it longer so that this would fit nicely into the top of these vegas and give a seal around it and allow any contents to only escape through the tube. The LMA protector, which is one of the later versions coming from the company, tells you the same thing again. There is a first seal around the larynx and there is a second seal around the esophagus. Right? But some other devices took a completely opposite route. You have the eye gel, which is a cuffless device. So you just put it in and it's pre-molded. It does, you don't inflate anything. So what they've done, if you compare a similar size, a size eye gel to LMA protector, you notice how much smaller the, L, the eye gel is. The idea is that it is trying to stay away from the upper esophageal sphincter, but it still has a gastric brain. And then there are further other devices like the slipper. What these people have done is that they have designed a, this doesn't even have a second channel, but it's got a big cavity. Uh, and if there was even up to 20, 25 ml of fluid that came up, it can be accommodated within the cavity uh, and that should give airway protection. Uh, and the Basca mask has multiple features. It has got a cavity and it has got double gastric drainage channels. So you can see how the ideas have continued to evolve uh, and more and more different features are trying to be incorporated to make the feature, the devices better. Okay, let's look at one more thing. When you're holding a face mask, how to get a good seal? If, you, if you're holding a face mask, if it's leaking, you can see where it is leaking. Maybe you adjust it, choose a different size. And if it's still leaking, you just press down harder. How to do it when you're doing a laryngeal mask? The thing is, when you, sorry, I keep missing one arrow mark here. When we anesthetize patients, these tissues, lose their tone and start collapsing backwards. And that's a problem when you're doing a face mask ventilation, but actually works in your favor with a laryngeal mask because this is going to come down, it should press down on your laryngeal mask, but that may not be enough in itself. And in which case, if you want to achieve a better pressure, one of the first things, again, coming from Dr. Brain's research is what about putting a cuff at the back of the LMA? When you inflate it, maybe it will push itself further up towards the larynx. And that idea is taken forward even in some of the more modern ones like the Pro Seal, which has got a dorsal cuff. Okay. Then other devices are there. The cuffless device, such as an eye gel, uses a anatomical shape 
and a cuff which is or it's not a cuff it is a, a gel material which they say kind of softens when at body temperature and hopefully it will mold a bit better so as time goes on in fact it should get a better seal and of course you have these devices which have a, a, another different approach so they are hollow and because they are hollow the seal is linked to the airway pressure so when the airway pressure is increased, when you give a positive pressure breath, it also presses down on the seal. So each time a positive pressure breath is given, this seal pressure is also variable. Because if you have a constant high pressure, it may cause damage to mucosa or to the even nerve damage. And that's one of the things which is trying to be addressed by a variable cuff pressure. So as you can see, the the number of problems, the number of concepts are very varied. I have tried to explore some of these. Okay. And to address each of these, they have tried to design different, different devices. And as the progress has happened, as things have evolved, we have devices which incorporate multiple features. So to, coming towards the end of my presentation, just a quick look at some of the devices which have come about. The laryngeal tube, is a very simple device. It's a peri pharyngeal sealer. And then there is a second generation one which adds a channel for gastric outlet. You have a device called the Cobra Airway, which beautifully looks like the head of a Cobra, but look at it closely. It resembles a griddle airway with a cuff built into it and a soft tip. You have the eye gel, which incorporates many different features. I've spoken about some of these things. It's got a gastric channel. It's got a flattened tube, which comes out through the pharynx, which sits better. It's got a bite block built into it. You have devices like the slipper, which uh, when I showed it to my trainee, the first thing she said was, it looks like a slipper. Uh, apparently it does, but it, it, what it is meant to be is streamlined pharyngeal airway. Um, and, and, and this device, like I explained, has a chamber within it to give you gastric protection and offers a variable sealing pressure. We have the Basca mask. The Basca mask in, uh, incorporates many of these different things. It's got a flattened tube. It's got two gastric channels. So you can connect it to a continuous suction while leaving the other one open to the atmosphere. And thereby, if there is anything that's come up as regurgitation, there's a little chamber called a sump chamber behind the airway itself. So there is a little bit of volume that can accumulate there and it can be sucked out. Another unique feature of this mask is got, it's got a little tab over here. Many of you may have observed LMA is coming out blood stained and often the insertion part itself is a bit traumatic. Getting it to curve around the pharynx is a bit traumatic. What this mask does is when you are inserting, if you pull on this tab, it causes the tip of it to bend forwards and flex forwards and helps with insertion. The LMA protector coming in from the classic LMA family. Um, now this has come about with a cuff pressure monitor, the cuff pilot technology, which tells you that you have the adequate amount of pressure. It gives you two seals, two channels, ability to have continuous suction, ability to put a gastric tube, ability to even intubate through this. So as you can see how more and more and more features are being added on to the same device. The LMA Blockbuster made by a Chinese company, again incorporates multiple features. It's got a <clears throat> four-way connector, which helps to stabilize the airway. It has got dual channels. It, 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 the unique feature of this one is it's got a little ridge over here. Um, and what it does is when you try to intubate through this, the ridge improves the angle at which the endotracheal tube comes out. And of course it comes with its own specialist ET tube, which improves your chances of achieving intubation through this. More about this in the next talks because you will hear more about laparoscopy and intubation later. So ultimately the future, is it here yet? Putting it all together, you can see there are multiple issues and we have tried many different things over many years and many people are thinking about it. I'm sure in the audience today, we will have somebody who has other ideas. So we will see more devices coming out and hopefully better ones. But potentially you need to have the correct device for the correct thing that you're doing. 
uh, most of us in most institutions will not have the luxury of having all devices available to you. So you need to think about the kind of work that you're doing um, and your budget and, and a lot of practical things before you can maybe zero down on two or three devices which are more suitable for you. Also, there is a learning curve. Any new device you pick up, you need a few hundred insertions before you get really good at it. Um, so all of that has to be thought about. Uh, but yes, there will be more innovations and more better things that will come out in the future. And maybe we'll retire our older devices, but we'll have better ones to replace them with. Thank you. Thank you, Tejas, uh, for a wonderful lecture. It was a beautiful storytelling. It made so many things clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, have you unshared your screen? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, can you see my screens? Yes, yes, okay, it's fine. Good evening. Uh, now that uh, we heard the evolution of LMA, and now we'll go specific to a couple of other uh, interesting talks. The first one is the role of a Laringin mask airway in the difficult airway algorithm. I will be talking in. Uh, accordance with the ASA difficult airway algorithm, which came out in the uh, end of last year and the beginning of this year. So there, as we all know, uh, the ASA difficult airway algorithm has got two limbs. One is the awake limb and one is the anesthetized limb. So if you ask me uh, to summarize my talk, I, I will say it has got five clear cut roles, one in the awake limb and four in the asleep limb. So we'll just look at uh, each of them uh, in a bit more detail. So if you look at the awake uh, airway management limb, the LMA can be used as a conduit for intubation. So when you talk about the awake limb, the operator has already decided that the patient's trachea should be secured with an endotracheal tube. It can be because of the patient characteristics, surgical uh, requirement, or the operator's experience. And all of us who have used LMA knows very well that LMA can be placed uh, very comfortably with a bit of topicalization uh, and we are all of us have done it and you can use uh, a sedation judiciously that is again left to the discretion of the operator because if the patient is awake a bit of swallowing helps and once the LMA is in good position the shaft of the LMA is directed towards the larynx making the fiber optic easy and as the patient is awake the risk of this procedure is low and no options are eliminated when I say no options are eliminated you can back off at any time and come out of your plan and plan surgery at a time later. When I talk about the uh, airway management after induction of general anesthesia, it has got two roles in the non-emergency pathway and two roles in the uh, emergency pathway. So in the non-emergent pathway, it can act as a ventilatory mechanism to provide anesthesia. Again, uh, if you look at the latest ASA, they say that these are guidelines and this is this particular guideline has to be used on an individual patient based upon the discretion of the clinician. Okay, or it can be used as a conduit for fiber optic intubation. In the emergency pathway, uh, the, it can be used as a ventilatory device, but as a life-saving ventilatory device and obviously as a conduit for fiber optic intubation. I will not go into the difficult airway management per se here. So when you use uh, the non-emergent limb of the anesthetized pathway as a ventilatory device, we are talking about a can't intubate, but can ventilate. So one of the dictum is to continue ventilation with a face mask. But all of us has no and pages has proved the limit because the ventilation is definitely better. It gives you better oxygenation, frees the anesthetist hands, and it can be used as a conduit for intubation. However, if the patient is at risk of aspiration, sometimes uh, we give cricoid pressure, but I know there is controversies related to cricoid pressure, but most of us still feel that you can, you should be giving cricoid pressure till the airway is secured. So if you're giving cricoid, the uh, pressure can be momentarily released, or you can go for a second generation LMA. So uh, when you are going to use it as a conduit for tracheal intubation, um, 
uh, one of the advantage, like if you have done an oral intubation uh, in an anesthetized patient, whether you're using Oversepin airway, William airway, or Berman airway, you will have realized that uh, the, when you go through the oral route, the epiglottis may not be easily visible, but a bit of jaw thrust will bring the epiglottis into uh, picture or the vocal cord into picture. This is because uh, these airways uh, doesn't perform as well as a good airway to prevent the tongue falling back to the posterior pharyngeal wall. So LMA actually gives an unopposed or unobstructed airway from the mouth to the larynx. So coming to the uh, role of LMA in the anesthetized emergency limb. So here we are talking about a can't intubate, can't intubate a ventilate scenario or a can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario or according to the uh, IDA, uh, it's a complete ventilation failure. So here we are talking uh, of LMA as a life-saving ventilatory device. Again, here, if the ventilation is good, yes, you can think about using it as a conduit for tracheal intubation. But if the ventilation is not great, that means uh, you should understand that the LMA is not well aligned and or there may be a periglottic pathology. So uh, in this case, you should not be um, doing a fiber optic guided intubation as it may be very difficult. So these are the cases where you should consider waking the patient up on LMA and you should avoid losing what you already have and uh, reach a surgical airway access. So uh, I've been um, talking about the role of uh, LMA as a conduit for intubation. So one of the, the, we are now going to the second part of the talk because most of us who talk that LMA can be used uh, as a conduit for intubation has probably not done it. So uh, one uh, important dictum in the management of difficult airway is that uh, you should be doing something which you're familiar with. So if you're going to do a case and um, you have reached a, uh, um, can't uh, intubate scenario. You should think at the pause at that pause and think at that particular time whether I have to intubate this patient or can I manage the case with an LMA, and then you can decide which one is better for you. So you need to understand certain basic concepts whenever you're planning to uh, do an intubation through an LMA. So if you're talking about a blind intubation through an LMA, the success rate is about thirty percentage. But however, if you use a fiber optic to guide your endotracheal tube, the success becomes about 95%. So as I said earlier, uh, you need to stop and think and decide whether a definitive airway is essential. Can I uh, do this case on laryngeal mask airway? Okay, so again, one more thing which has to be underlined that it has, it's important to concentrate on oxygenation because all of us know that the failure to inhibit but if you reach a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, that is something which you can cause a morbidity. So again, we need to understand certain other important things, uh, which is the size of the endotracheal tube, which will fit into the LMA. So uh, there are certain basic caveats, like you need to lubricate the laryngeal mask uh, in endotracheal tube well, so that it uh, offers a good passage. In stressful si situation, uh, consider downsizing the endotracheal tube and select LMA designed for intubation. So we'll look at certain LMAs. First will be the classic LMA. So I'll talk primarily on the size 3, 4, and 5 because these are the adult sizes. The classic LMA theoretically will take a 6 size endotracheal tube through both 3 and 4 and a 5 size classic LMA will take a size 7. If you look at IGEL and AMBOR again, IGEL will take 6, 7, and 8 through the size three, four, and five, and AMBO or again, gain is gastric access and intubation will take 6.5, 7.5, and eight. If you look at LMA Supreme, it is not uh, designed for intubation. I'll tell you uh, why in a minute uh, later. If you look at fast track or an intubating LMA, um, you can see that since this is the intubating LMA, it gives you the biggest possible size. Size three itself will take give you seven, Four also will give seven and size will give you eight size uh, endotracheal tube, but it's a specially designed endotracheal tube. ProSeal or uh, other LMA like a LMA uh, reinforced, uh, both have reinforced wire within the airway tube. So obviously the lumen is narrow. So the five size tube will go with difficulty through size three and four and reinforced tube, it's 4.5. So all of us know that if you're trying to intubate something like a 
five size cuff tube or a 4.5 size cuff tube and ventilate an adult patient is going to be difficult. So these uh, proceal reinforced and supreme are not designed. So uh, you should not be using it if your plan is to have a definitive airway. Now let us look at uh, how each of these uh, LMAs fare in terms of intubation. So you can see that this has got a relatively longer tube, which has got a narrow diameter. So if you're planning to use this LMA in a crisis situation and wants to change it, you need to go through an uh, FOB and entry catheter uh, technique. I'll come to it a bit later. So uh, as uh, Dr. Tejas correctly explained, they, they have got epiglottic elevating bar. In the earlier days, we used to cut this epiglottic elevating bar so that the endotracheal tube could be passed. But when you pass it, you clearly know that the bevel comes out very comfortably through the, uh, these bars. So you don't actually have to cut it. So now let us look at these uh, uh, LMAs. So you can see the epiglottic elevating bar. So let us uh, look at the theoretical aspects now. Okay, this is a newer model, which is something like a LMA unique, uh, which has got uh, no epiglottic elevating bar. So if you try to pass a six size endotracheal tube, these are lubricated tubes, it will, you can see that it's not going. So I'm trying to deflate the cuff a bit more so that cuff itself is not a hindrance. Okay, this is important because if you have not done it before and you take a six size tube and try to shove it down, you can see that it's not going. So only I'm going to take a 5.5 cuff and there is a, a one LMA which will go through it. Okay, so this is an important concept. You cannot um, do this uh, for the first time uh, when you have a airway crisis. So you can see that when the LMA pass through the uh, endotracheal tube, only about, about seven centimeter comes out. Okay, the, I, I will tell you the importance of this. Okay, so now let us see the alignment. So uh, when the LMA is in place, okay. You can see that the uh, tip of the LMA is sitting into the upper esophageal sphincter. So because the shape is conical, you can see that there is a triangular orifice at the upper esophageal sphincter. So when, as Dr. Uh, uh, Tejas correctly said, if you're having something sitting here, this uh, the tendency of the upper esophagus will be to relax. And we can see that when you have a triangular hole like this, if there is regurgitation, it will come here and it can contaminate the airway. The other thing which can happen is if your uh, seating is not great and you are supposed to uh, ventilate the patient with anything more than 15 centimeter pressure, slowly you will produce inflation of the stomach, okay? If you produce inflation of the stomach, after some time, it can result in aspiration. But if you ask me, this is a very good alignment, okay? So now let us come back to this video. So now let us look at the LMA Supreme. So when you look at the LMA Supreme, you realize that the gastric channel is banged through the center of the airway and the airway channel comes through the side. When you have an airway channel coming through the side, you know that it's not going to be in a perfect alignment. What is more important is that it has got a narrow airway channel. So you can see that there's an airway, uh, sorry, the entry intubation catheter, which has got a, um, which is coming out through a three size um, uh, LMA Supreme. It's, it, this itself is quite snug. So you cannot try to exchange something uh, like this. So this is the reason why I said LMA Supreme is not something which is really great uh, for intubation. But if you are planning to do the case with the LMA Supreme, it's a great device. Now let us look at IGEL. As I said earlier, the sizes 3, 4, and 5 will take LMA 6, 7, 8. Okay. And the, this um, thermoplastic uh, uh, device hmm, has got... Um, got a, a gastric channel at the tip. And you can see that the airway tube is quite wide, okay? And uh, the, uh, the size of the LMA, which it will take, it will be written on the LMA itself. So you don't have to actually remember. So now let us see the introduction of IGEL. So um, here, uh, you can ask your assistant to gently open the mouth and while a lubricated IGEL is placed. Okay, so whenever you uh, are doing to going to intubate a patient uh, with through an LMA, it is important to make sure that airway is correctly placed. 
So when you say that airway is correctly placed, uh, you should be able to get a tidal volume of about 7 ml per kg with about um, 15 centimeter water airway pressure. Okay. So, and you should be able to get a good chest rise and a bilateral um, uh, and a good ETCO2. Okay. So now let us see uh, uh, the view which we see. Okay. Um, so if you remember the point uh, which Tejas was trying to underline, here, unlike the classic LMA, this LMA is not sitting deep into the upper esophagus. Okay, so it's quite up. Okay, and the alignment is quite good, and no epiglottis is seen within the airway. Okay, so now let us continue with this video. So, if you're going to uh, intubate, um, so again, as I said, uh, with IGEL, the uh, chance of blind intubation is slightly more higher. So I was just trying to do it. So the tube went in comfortably. I didn't have any air, air resistance. So I'm just trying to connect it and ventilate. So you can see that there is ETCO2 and a uh, good uh, bilateral chest movement. So there are two options here. One is to uh, leave the uh, endotracheal tube, uh, in situ, sorry, the IGEL in situ and fix the endotracheal tube with the IGEL. Or you need to take the IGEL out. Unlike the intubating LMA, you don't uh, have a uh, um, uh, ILMA stabilizer with these other devices. So what I am trying to do is I am using a five-size um, uh, endotracheal tube, which is connected to the six-size endotracheal tube at the back. And uh, that will give us the extra length. So let us see how we do it. So it is connected. And in order to make sure that we have a patent airway, I'm just connecting it and ventilating. So, okay, that is fine. The assistant can continue to maintain the air weight while I pull the LMA out. So here you don't have to deflate the LMA. I'm slowly taking the LMA out through the same trajectory. Okay. And you should have a good assistant who can hold to the endotracheal tube when it when the LMA comes out. Okay. The LMA comes out. It is important to make sure that you connect the uh, connector back and check for the ventilation. Okay. So uh, this is something. Uh, uh, which you can do to get that extra length. So use a smaller size tube to get that extra length. Okay. So now we'll go to the alternative technique. So here, uh, like uh, uh, it's important to maintain anesthesia while you are doing uh, any kind of uh, airway exchange. So one of the option is to maintain it with proper fold. Other option is to continue your anesthesia with the inhalation anesthetic. So here, what we have done is you have a uh, LMA, which is in situ. And I have passed the endotracheal tube and uh, got it to about 16 centimeter. When you get it to about 16 centimeter, the LMA, uh, so the endotracheal tube is just reaching the epiglottis, uh, that level. Okay. And you inflate the cuff and continue to ventilate. Then you pass a fiber optic through a fiber optic swell connector. And under vision, you can guide it inside. So it takes you another one minute to pass the endotracheal uh, tube into the LM, uh, to the trachea. And here, you don't have to take it out. As I said earlier, you just leave the LMA because it doesn't have any cup. And I will explain to you why you want to have the LMA in situ and continue with your anesthetic. So the third LMA I'm going to talk about is AMBO or AGAIN. So GAIN is gastric access and intubation. So you can see that it's a LMA designed to intubate a patient. That is why the size 3 is taking 6.5, which is good enough for a female. Size 4 will take 7.5, which is uh, quite good for a male patient. Uh, and um, so when you look at the AMBO or again, it is important that we deflate the cup before we start. So I deflated the cup. It has got a shape which is quite similar to the uh, uh, intubating LMA. So again, the introduction is uh, quite uh, similar. Uh, so LMA, I, the AMBOR again is in, in situ. You inflate the cup and then connect it to the um, anesthesia breathing circuit and check for ventilation. Once the ventilation is good, again by the same criteria, then you can think about intubation. So uh, here, I just want to uh, try um, intubating with a um, uh, endotracheal tube blindly. So the, here the alignment was quite good. Um, Okay, so again, uh, this one, you can see that it is sitting a bit more deeper. Okay. 
sorry. Sorry for the technical glitch. So um, if you look at the um, you can look at the this yeah so uh, here uh, these uh, kind of LMAs are supposed to have something called a reinforced car okay so uh, the advantage of uh, this thing is it doesn't have it, it's a slightly more rounder contour of the tip rather than the conventional classic LMA. So uh, I tried to pass uh, the uh, tube uh, blindly, uh, but it has gone into the esophagus. So I will explain to you why. So um, so you can see that the endotracheal tube is in the esophagus. If you are not seeing the tracheal rings anteriorly and tracheal uh, uh, muscle posteriorly, then that means you are in the wrong pathway. So what you need to do is when you are reaching a situation like this, uh, you need to withdraw the endotracheal tube and railroad it over the fiber optic. So this is exactly the reason why you should not try blind intubation, which uh, I said has a success rate of about 30% in the classic LMA and in an LMA like uh, Ambuora or an uh, IGEL and a LMA uh, uh, fast track, it will have about 75 to 85 percentage. So uh, it is still not worth doing a blind intubation if you are in a difficult airway scenario. Okay, so that is one important dictum. So over the fiber optic, it was very easy. It went in beautifully. So other devices which uh, we want to just talk is ProSeal and Reinforce, which I said are not great LMAs if you are planning intubation. So you can see that in the ProSeal also, it is this has got a reinforced channel, which is narrow. So obviously, this is not something which you are uh, going to use if your plan is to intubate the patient or if the patient is at high risk of aspiration. So now uh, the Basca LMA, which uh, again, um, uh, Tejas has said. So here, unlike the uh, classic, uh, sorry, IGEL LMA, which has got a wider tube, which has got the airway channel at the middle. Here you can see that airway channel is a smaller airway channel and it has got two gastric channel on either side. So the importance is given, given for prevention of aspiration. So this is designed for intubation. So uh, the 6.5 size is passing easily. Here, 6.5 size is uh, difficult. So again, uh, this is the reason why uh, the, my previous speaker has told very clearly that um, you need to know the uh, use. Then you can uh, decide on which LMA to use in a particular scenario. Okay. So uh, coming to the LMA fast track, this has got a good success rate without a fiber optic aid, even better with a fiber optic aid. So, however, the exchange can be uh, fiddly and uh, the sizes are available only in adult sizes 3, 4 and 5, which will take endotracheal tube 7, 7 and 8 respectively. So, you need to be uh, familiar, especially with the use of ILMA stabilizer. Okay. And for troubleshooting, you need to do the Chandis manual. So, if you're talking about the LMA fast track, it has got a different design for the epiglottic elevating bar. So, if you try to pass the LMA blindly, uh, 
it will come through either side. Okay, so this alignment will not be great. So what is this recommended is to pass the ILMA tube to about uh, 16 centimeters. That is when uh, the black mark is at the um, uh, introduce or the uh, connector level. The uh, ILMA tube will lift the epiglottic elevating bar and then you can pass the fiber optic through that. So I will show you how uh, you use the uh, I. If you look at the ILMA tube, it is got a spe specialized tube, which has got a, um, a two heat type of tip. That means the tip is curved. Okay. And you can see that there is a black line. This particular black line has to be along the uh, uh, inner incisor gap. And the second black line, when it comes here, so the, here is the second black line. When it comes to the connector level, it starts lifting the epiglottic elevating bar. So now let us look at the uh, alignment of ILMA. Okay, so I am going with the uh, tube. So it is when it lifts up, the angle is quite good. Right? So uh, it has got a conical shaped uh, area which will improve the angulation. Okay, I'll explain to you in the next slide. So uh, when you look at the intubation through ILMA, so here uh, you introduce the ILMA uh, like this. Again, the uh, first part is the same. You uh, inflate the cuff and make sure that your um, uh, chest is moving well. Because of the lack of time, I'll just po uh, po postpone the video. You can see that the tip is uh, different here. It's called, called a two heat tip. Okay, so it is curved. So I, I'll explain why the manufacturers op opted for a two heat tip uh, in my next slide. So when you go in, you can see uh, there is a two heat tip, and this is the passage through the metal uh, tube of a uh, metal airway tube. Okay, so you because it has got a flexometallic tube, you can see the ease with which the tube has gone into the trachea. So I have not used uh, the fiber optic as a conduit here, but I used it like a more like a GoPro camera and the tube has gone beautifully in. Okay. So if you try to pass a normal uh, endotracheal tube uh, through the uh, ILMA, I'll tell you uh, how it is different. So I'll again skip the first part. And uh, again, I'll just show you the how the normal uh, tube goes. So uh, what is important uh, to understand here is it is the angle which is the culprit here. The normal tube also comes out lifting the epiglottic elevating bar, but you can see that it is hitching on to the anterior arytenoid. Okay, so it will not go like that easily. So you need to rotate it by 180 degrees, or you need to railroad it over the fiber optic bronchoscope. So I will explain to you why. So if you look at the um, ILMA tube. So this is the angle that is about 20 degree or 15 degree angle. This is the angle through which it comes out of the ILMA. But if you use a normal tube, it is coming out almost double the angle, 50 degree. So this is the reason why it is going and hitching onto the uh, anterior commissure. So if you're forced to use a normal tube, okay, because some of the senders uh, don't have the ILMA tube and there are incidences where your surgical colleagues have gone and cut the uh, Cuff. So uh, it's not very easy to procure. It's very costly, about 45,000 per ILMA. So uh, what you need to do is you need to rotate the endotracheal tube by 180 degree so that it comes out at about 20 degree angle, something similar to the ILMA tube. Okay. So these are small tricks which can help you increase the success. So uh, if you don't have any of these fancy LMAs and you have only the classic LMA or you are forced to use a classic LMA because it is a only rescue airway device available, then we have uh, its ideal method will be to use an entry catheter. Okay, so entry catheter has got 56 centimeter uh, long and it has got an internal diameter of 4.7 and an outer diameter of 6.5, so that you can use a seven size endotracheal tube. You can see that if you use an Ambuscope 3 or a Carl Stoss 5, uh, it can fit in comfortably. And the tip uh, is about four centimeter below. Uh, before the tip of the fiber optic so that you can uh, do the manipulation of the fiber optic also. 
So I will explain, I will not go through the slide. I will rather show you the intubating procedure. But what is important to understand here is uh, if you're not familiar with the use of entry, you should not use a jet ventilator because people have gone and produced pneumothorax. And if you are not careful with the movement, if you shove it too much in, again, it can result in airway injury like Cook's airway exchange catheter. Okay, so now let us go uh, to uh, see how uh, we do the uh, uh, intubation. Okay, the first part I have uh, 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 bypassed because here the first part is the same as uh, uh, the checking the alignment. So uh, what, what is more important is how to railroad the airway exchange catheter. So uh, the air, the entry catheter, which is I said is about 56 centimeter, is loaded onto the five size um, sorry, four millimeter uh, Carl Stoss uh, uh, video endoscope, and um, under fiber optic vision, this is guided into the uh, trachea. Okay. Okay. We try to go through the central lumen and enter the trachea and railroad it. See, after you uh, railroad the uh, airway exchange catheter, you can take the fiber optic out. Then you can deflate the um, uh, classic LMA and uh, take it out. So before you do that, it is make sure it's uh, worthwhile connecting it to a normal connector and ventilate. So you don't have to do a jet ventilation. You can actually do a conventional ventilation, which will be much more safer. Okay. So when you deflate the LMA, uh, sorry, when you, if you have to remove the LMA, you need to deflate the cup and take the LMA out. Again, uh, go through a smooth motion because it has got 56 centimeter long. It has got sufficient length uh, for the LMA to be taken out without uh, accidentally or inadvertently pulling the uh, entry catheter out of the trachea. Okay. So after you do this, what is important is rather than blindly railroading, it is better to do a laryngoscopy. So initially, I wanted to uh, do the uh, CMAC um, uh, so that we could get a video guide, but uh, the CMAC unfortunately didn't work. So I had to use a classical uh, Macintosh. Uh, so again, I'm checking and making sure that uh, the uh, entry catheter is in situ so that at no point we are compromising. Okay, so what you need to do is do a laryngoscope and then introduce the tube because this particular maneuver that is uh, doing a laryngoscopy will facilitate uh, the introduction. Okay. So um, again, uh, what is uh, very important is when you look at the ILMA, you can see that it has got a wider tube, which is very short. So you can see that there is about half of the endotracheal tube is coming out of the LMA. But if you take a classic LMA, you can see that hardly about eight centimeters of the endotracheal tube. So this is a six size tube, which comes out of the LMA. So uh, if you look at the length from the epiglottic elevating bar to the vocal cord, it is about 3.5 centimeter uh, in males and about three centimeters in female. And we all know that the distance from the endotracheal tube tip to the proximal end of the cup, it is about five centimeter. So uh, when you have a situation like this, this cup will be sitting in between the vocal cord. You can see that uh, hardly about half four centimeter or 3.5 centimeter of the endotracheal tube is in situ. So if you try to pull out the, the classic LMA with only three centimeter of the endotracheal tube in situ, you are in for disaster unless you extend the tube length with a, um, a smaller size ED tube or you have something like this, which is the uh, uh, LMA stabilizer. So again, when you're using a classic tube, these are the uh, certain problems because you, if you have the bevel, uh, which is there is a disparity between the AEC or the fiber optic and the uh, bevel, then this will go and hitch on to the arytenoid. So there are newer tubes like a Genesis tube, uh, which has got a uh, again curved tip or an ILMA tube, which has got a two hitch shaped tip. The gap, there is no gap. So the chance of it hitching onto the arytenoid is less. Or uh, as they just told that LMA block buster comes with a Parker flex tube. So again, that will be very snug and it will not uh, hitch on to the uh, uh, arytenoids. Okay. So um, 
uh, if an um, suitability to assess the suitability of an endotracheal tube uh, to uh, be intubated, you need to have ideally a wire reinforced tube, which is soft, which you have clearly seen how it is superior. Preferably a soft tip like a silicon tip, which is a rounded in shape. Okay. And uh, if you're going to use a, um, a normal tube, it's preferred to use a posterior facing tip called a Genesis tube. And if you are forced to use a normal endotracheal tube, you should do a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation so that it doesn't pitch. Okay. And they have a mechanism for uninterrupted ventilation. So this is a new endotracheal uh, tube with a fa posterior facing bevel. Uh, sorry, uh, bevel. It's called Genesis tube, uh, which is not available in India. So if you ask me, which I will prefer, if I am forced to intubate, I'll probably go with an IGEL uh, or an AMBOVER again. Or if I'm having a fast track, I'll go through it. So next will be one another important question: Should you remove the LMA in case of a difficult airway? The answer is no, because at the end of the case, the patient may be extubated. Uh, of the endotracheal tube while the LMA remains in situ. So uh, we have a well-functioning upper airway device which is already in place and we all know that there is, it has got a proven mechanism for reintubation uh, if, uh, if it is needed. So basically whenever you have a difficult airway scenario as AIDA classification says uh, you are to, uh, expecting a high-risk extubation. Okay. So uh, it's better to have the LMA in situ and it's uh, sensitive to leave the cuff deflated, especially it's going to have, be a long surgery. But if you have an IGIT, you can leave it in the trachea uh, with, along with the endotracheal tube. So to conclude, um, you should be familiar with the use of uh, laryngeal uh, mask airway as a conduit for intubation. And uh, you should understand that the intubation is not mandatory because we all have understood that LMA works very well as a ventilator device, even in patients with Cognac and Lahane 3 and 4. And you should be familiar. So when you get workshops, um, try and attend it. Or if you have an airway lab or patients, uh, straightforward patients, try to intubate these patients with the LMA and see the practical difficulty. And um, uh, I think I'll, uh, the last line is for Dr. Rakesh. So uh, if you are uh, doing high-risk cases like uh, obstetrics or obesity. Uh, prob the previous um, uh, consensus was that uh, don't leave the airway un uh, in unsecure and intubate the patient. But with the availability of the newer generation LMA, should I uh, continue to use an LMA or should I intubate? I think I will leave it uh, for Dr. Rakesh to discuss. Thank you so much. Um, now, um, it's my privilege uh, to uh, have Dr. Rakesh Gar, who is an additional professor at the Old Institute of Medical Science. And uh, there is no one better than Rakesh to talk on the next topic, which is uh, the controversies and the evolving roles. Over to you, Rakesh. It is not audible. Now we'll be talking about the evolving roles of various supraglottic airway devices. We have seen that with time, 
the role and the involvement of uh, the supragotic airway devices in the management of airway has evolved in many aspects. I bring greetings from my institute. Now, when you talk of the supragotic airway devices, I think uh, uh, from the early 1980s, uh, the this newer devices has evolved out from the conventional endotracheal tube. And uh, this gentleman, Dr. Archie Brain, was the person who first developed these devices and brought it into the clinical practice, which has subsequently been evolved into various modifications and various types that had changed the clinical practice for the airway management. The device which was earliest made was a conventional classic LMA, but subsequently the armamentarium of various different types of photographic airway devices has come into clinical practice. This whole era of uh, uh, various devices then was subsequently uh, classified based on certain characteristics and it was labeled as first generation supragotic airway device, second generation supragotic airway device, third generation supragotic airway device. The first generation was primarily uh, with, with a simple breathing tube uh, connected with a mask or opening at the larynx. On the other hand, to have some additional safety mechanisms, there was a provision of gastric drainage and improved protection against aspiration and these devices were labeled as second generation devices. And subsequently, uh, the various other safety features were added to these devices and they were uh, summarily labeled as third generation supragotic airway devices. Also, the another classification because the sealing mechanism is one of the important aspects for the clinical use of these devices and hence they were labeled as cuffed perilaryngeal sealers like ILMA, PLMA or the cuffed peripharyngeal sealers like uh, uh, the laryngeal tubes and then cuffless and atomical pre-shaped sealers like ISIL which is uh, currently one of the uh, most used supragotic airway devices. And based on these devices, uh, the, uh, the various advantages of uh, modifications due to modifications has been made into these devices uh, as earliest as hand-free ventilation, especially when you talk of the ventilation by using uh, mass ventilation where a seal has to be made, but this LMA has created hands-free ventilation. But subsequently, um, uh, they, they, they were used for uh, uh, many other advantages of these tubes and, and these advantages are being added day on day because of various, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, various uh, improvement that has been done in these devices and now they, the armamentarium of supragotic devices has many many advantages now these supragotic area devices if they see the clinical practice they have been used in variable way not only during part of primary intubation uh, but also they can be used for various surgical procedures and these devices have been used in a hybrid technique of extubation wherein these devices are uh, use as a replacement to the endotracheal tube at the time of intubation for its various advantages like optimization of the sympathetic response or the evaluation of uh, vocal cords or the trachea through them and hence these hybrid techniques are being used. Also, the supragotic airway devices are not being used just as a primary management of the airway and various surgical procedures are being done but they are being used as adjunct and rescue also wherein uh, a difficult airway can be seen and the evidence is emerging and evidence with regard to the type of surgical procedures but also concerns related to various other things like positioning, lateral position, prone position and also uh, in specific certain situations like uh, difficult airway uh, or we can say during the resuscitation the evidence has emerged and its utility has been confirmed in certain aspects. It is emerging in certain other aspects and it has uh, you know, change the clinical practice of airway management in certain aspects. And due to these evidences uh, which has been generated for the use of safe use of supragotic airway devices, uh, the various guidelines has incorporated supragotic airway devices as and one of the important uh, tools, especially when the primary endotracheal intubation is failed they have been used, whether we talk of the adult airway management guidelines, even in the obstetric airway uh, management of unanticipated difficult tracheal intubation, even in the pediatric also, it has been safely used. 
As I mentioned earlier, the hybrid technique of extirpation several robotic airway devices has found its role. And even in the outside the operating room, like critical care setup or in the emergency area, the supraglottic airway devices has found its role. So this means the evidence has clearly shown that these devices are useful in uh, in many aspects and its role has evolved out of uh, the operating room and out of the uh, standard uh, indications. Now it is being used in varied indications, whether we talk of the obstetric patients, whether we talk for laparoscopic surgeries and certain evidence which is emerging for its safe use in the prone position also. So this means the, evol uh, the evolution of the uh, supraglottic area devices with its various types, modifications and safety mechanisms. It has found its role and hence it has an important role in the area management. Now these newer supraglottic area devices I mentioned that they are evolved. So the, the evolution has happened with regards to various things like the design of these devices, the material of these devices and the incubation part. I'll just take you through uh, before I take it for a specific indication for that for their use. If you see the design changes, you no know, uh, certain devices like Proxy Lalame has a dedicated channel for it. Uh, they have been angulated so that they are uh, getting better fit into the uh, airway anatomy and hand seal is better. Uh, these devices uh, have been incorporated with a bite block. They have more broader so that this displacement becomes less and they have a detachable connector that is sometimes very useful, especially um, sometimes some of these devices are used for intubation also. The cuffs has uh, been modified uh, for various uh, changes and that has provided advantages also in the form of uh, better seal pressure, lesser chances of uh, uh, or risk of uh, aspiration by preventing aspiration. Like for example, say the proceed LMA has dual cuff, the dorsal and the ventral cuff that makes a better seal. The placement of the cuff, the sealing pressure, the material, uh, they, they, uh, some of the devices are non-inflatable and a specific material and the mechanism, some of the self-inflatable cuffs so that the seals become pressure in the air if the air pressures are much more. The sealing mechanism, some provide seals at the base of tongue, some at the laryngeal inlet, and some at the pharyngeal inlet and each has its own plus and minuses that uh, which is better but yes each mechanism had its own importance and uh, by improving the sealing mechanism the role of uh, supraglottic air devices has been found in uh, even for positive pressure ventilations which safe can be used with these devices the the, the various design changes uh, has been with regards to materials, with regards to color coding of these devices, the disposable materials and the presence of the epiglottic bars, which has its importance and maintenance of the potency. Now, these all safety features are the primary reason that the clinical usage of supraglottic airway devices has been increased in variety of procedures. Also, the protection against aspiration because of high sealing pressures, the presence of gastric drainage channel and the presence of suction port has made its uses into various surgical procedures. Also, there was a concern that uh, the high pressure of the cuff can be an issue. It can cause various complications and injuries to the airway. But now some of the devices like AirQ uh, or the ISEL has found its role that they have a specific mechanism of either the cuff inflation or a soft material has been used which prevents the excessive pressure over the airway structures and hence uh, the less chances of trauma in spite of making a better seal. The positive pressure ventilation um, uh, modifications has been done in the various devices with higher sealing pressures, with adjustable pressures, with variable pressures and this is the reason that uh, they have been used to uh, in the various surgical procedures, even where the neuromuscular blocking is being used and the patients can be ventilated with positive pressure using these devices. Even outside the hospital, as I mentioned, uh, these devices are now MRI compatible uh, in view of various infection causes uh, or anaphylaxis. They are having material which is either disposable or palate free and hence they are found useful. Now let's come to the uh, various uh, uh, 
uh, uses with regards to need for the ventilation. And uh, if you see the devices, uh, the data has immersed uh, with regards to the ventilation mode. If you see the earlier data, which was regards to the use of these devices only for the spontaneous breath, because the positive pressure was of a concern that uh, they can, uh, may, they may not be having good seal and hence uh, they may lead to the gastric insufflation or the regurgitation and aspiration. But uh, now data is coming that they can be used easily for even for positive pressure ventilation. Now, when we say that uh, uh, the mode of ventilation, yes, uh, majority of time the early data was uh, in sync with the use of uh, the pressure controlled ventilation for these devices. Because we cannot compare uh, pressure controlled versus volume control because respiratory rate and peak inspiratory are set to avoid high peak pressures and to prevent air gas leaks and gastric insufflation. That's why the pressure controlled has been used, uh, which maintains the safety of uh, usage of these devices with regards to the need of uh, ventilation. And peak pressure should be set between 15 to 20, but the newer devices, even the peak pressures can be taken a little higher, even with safety. Now, when we talk of the obese patients, uh, initially it was a concern that the higher air pressures may be an issue and hence uh, there could be uh, concerns for its use in the obese patients because they will have higher peak inspiratory pressures. And uh, the concerns regarding to inadequate ventilation, leak around the device, gastric insufflation, but they are primarily with the earlier devices where the seal pressures were low and uh, uh, the safety mechanisms were less. With the evolution of the various supragotic airway devices, uh, it has been seen. If you see this uh, nice Cochrane analysis, though done a little uh, a couple of years back, uh, we have found various advantages of uh, usage of these devices. And it has been clearly indicated that uh, in these various studies that the occurrence of uh, laryngospasm or bronchoconstrictions during the induction and during the recovery is much less when the supragotic airway devices were used and hence it was very beneficial for obese patients. And if you see the uh, various other parameters, again, uh, whether we talk about uh, uh, the surgical, the concerns during the surgery, surgical procedures, even for the laparoscopic surgeries, uh, the, the beneficial effects were in favor of uh, supragotic airway devices. And this, this Cochrane analysis was primarily for the proceed LMA, the second generation device, and the, uh, the beneficial effect was seen for majority of this. So when we see uh, uh, overall in this uh, Cochrane analysis, no serious complication or case of aspiration was reported in these patients. And the other advantage was that these patients, the post-operative hypoxemia was less common with the use of these supervertic area devices, and they could be ventilated easily intraoperatively. Maintenance of the airway was well, and the surgery could be done uneventful. Indicated that the second generation supragotic airway devices had its role for various surgical procedures in obese. But try to avoid in uh, patients who are having a BMI more than 35, uh, prolonged surgical procedures when the patient is placed in the therapy position, and when the access to air will be limited during the procedure. But with more advancement and more understanding of the uh, supragotic airway devices with experience in safe hands, it can be considered in selected population safely. When we talk about the ENT procedures, uh, again, they have been uh, safely used and the various advantages has been you know, uh, put up in ENT surgical procedure. Also, especially like uh, these devices have been found to save for safe surgical procedure, nasal surgeries, for tonsillar surgeries. And uh, the complication rate, uh, like it, if it's this uh, a study where the percentage of uh, patients with hoarseness with the device used was much less with the use of LMAs as compared to the endotracheal tube. And hence, the respiratory complications are much less even in the anti-surgical procedures. The other uh, uh, usage has been reported during the resuscitation aspects. We know that uh, the endotracheal intubation remains one of the important uh, tool for securing the airway, a definitive airway because of its many advantages. But it requires a high level of skills and experience and regular training and practice. And we know that uh, uh, the, uh, the potential risk associated with out of hospital endotracheal intubation is uh, related to many aspects because uh, the Skill-based procedures may not be available at all places. Resuscitation remains a time-bound pattern. And hence, uh, the 
complications with related to the undertaken intubation placement may occur. There could be misplacement, there could be delay in the intubation, or there could be delay in the restart of uh, uh, cardiac compression leading to the poorer outcome, and hence this has been concerns. So this is an interesting study where they have compared uh, various airway management uh, strategies for uh, patients undergoing CPR, though this is a human cadaver pilot study. And they have decided, they have uh, looked for the uh, various objective parameters for regurgitation and pulmonary aspiration. And they have found that uh, the, though the uh, endotracheal intubation was uh, having uh, lesser amount of adverse events as compared to the LMAs, uh, the first generation LMA, but they were better with second generation LMAs. And hence, uh, the utility of the second generation LMAs appears to be promising for its uses as compared to the endotracheal intubation uh, uh, or make it say, comparable with endotracheal intubation and especially where the experience of doing laryngoscopy and intubation is not good it appears that probably this uh, tool can be used uh, as an airway management strategy in this situation and hence it has been mentioned that uh, the endotracheal intubation is superior to uh, airway devices or bag was ventilation in terms of protection against aspiration during ongoing CPR but uh, the usage of uh, the, the advanced uh, supraglottic area devices may have superior role in inexperienced hand for maintaining the airway. Now, another uh, uh, area where uh, supraglottic airway devices has been used and being assessed is with regards to its uh, role in prone position. Certain surgeries are being done in prone position. So this is an interesting study. Uh, done a couple of years back, but still shown a good result where the uh, where the patients, 50 patients were enrolled for a uh, surgery in prone position, and uh, they have found that the uh, the the use of uh, uh, laryngeal mass in prone position when they have compared its usage with regards to the various timings and safety, and they have found that uh, the the use of LMAs in in the prone position has its advantage and no complications or airway loss was observed in this study uh, when the LMA was used in prone position. And also the hemodynamic fluctuation, as we all know, and there are, there are many studies now that the hemodynamic fluctuations are much lesser with the use of supraglottic airway devices as compared to the endotracheal intubation. In another study now, uh, uh, the other indications, like for example, say vertebral surgeries, spine surgeries, um, uh, these devices has found its role uh, earlier. The conventional, conventionally, the endotracheal intubation remains the standard way. But now, uh, the supraglottic airway devices has been found to be safe uh, for its uses in elective lumbar vertebral surgeries also. Uh, and uh, the various devices has been compared in in these studies, and uh, um, they have been found to be safe used when we talk of IZL or Alnipoprene. Now, when we talk about these devices, uh, the placement and the intraoperatively events were comparable and found to be safe for its uses. Now, coming to the pediatric surgeries, uh, this is an interesting review article from India itself by Dr. Goel. And they have found that uh, the supraglottic airway devices now, since they are available for pediatric sizes also, they are being used variously in various surgeries, even including the laparoscopic surgeries, head and neck surgery, as I mentioned about tonsillectomy, outside the outside the OT areas like uh, CT scans, MRI suits, and for ventilation during resuscitation. And the safety is uh, confirmed in various of these procedures. But we should be a little uh, cautious, uh, and the author have mentioned it's concerned that uh, in in uh, in surgical procedures where prolonged ventilation is required or the surgery is prolonged, uh, including the ventilation in intensive care unit for a long period, is a concern and hence uh, its safety profile uh, is not well confirmed in these type of prolonged uh, surgeries or prolonged ventilation requirement in the ICU and hence it should be very, very cautiously used. The, on the other aspect, when we talk about this surgical procedure, it needs to be remembered that uh, the placement of these devices uh, also needs to be you know, confirmed and the technique that provides its best placement needs to be ascertained. Now, these various devices which has found its uh, improvement uh, uh, with subsequent time and uh, 
their changes in or modifications that I have discussed earlier has mandated that uh, these devices uh, are to be used in such a way that they are placed appropriately before we say that they can be safely used. And this is an interesting article where uh, they have given certain features where you can ascertain proper placement. Now, the requirement of an ideally positioned spinal device is whatever surgery we have just discussed, pediatrics, obese, prone, uh, spine surgeries, that the, the, the device is placed properly. The tip of distal cuff is in esophagus, apiglot is resting on outside of the cuff, tip of apiglot is aligned with the proximal cuff of the SAD. The cuff of SAD adequately inflated to produce seal, but not over inflated and avoidance of cuff floating. So these are the, this is, this, if we place it properly and check for its placement, if they are placed in following these characteristics properly, uh, probably the, the device is well placed. Also, we need to look for uh, certain things which uh, can lead to various complications. We need to avoid cuff hyperinflation, cuff hypoinflation, use of too deep or too small asoprotic airway devices, use of a too superficial or too large asoprotic airway devices. And the reason that has been seen uh, that uh, why they are not properly placed is whether their distal cuff is folded over or backward, the distal cuff is between the vocal parts, the epiglot is in the bowel of acid without downfolding, the the epiglot is with downfolding or with folding double. So these are the various malpositions which have been seen and we should be looking for the uh, corrective measures and these has been variously defined uh, depending upon various equipments. Now, this interesting article has well confirmed that uh, this uh, supragotic airway devices has an important role in the airway management in this era. And they have come up uh, not only with the single use with the concern of infection, they have mentioned about the newer devices have uh, many protective mechanisms with the higher ceiling pressures so that these can be used in various uh, surgical procedures. And as I mentioned earlier, that ceiling mechanisms are uh, you no know, uh, variably, uh, you no know, uh, mechanism used for these supraglottic airway devices, and hence they are useful. Again, I will come back uh, when we talk about the various placement concerns, we need to confirm it. We need to not only uh, be very sure about its correct placement and we need to poke up and that's why uh, new tools are emerging even for uh, looking for the malpositioning and confirmation that they are correctly placed. This is an interesting study where they have found that uh, these devices can be misplaced or malplaced in variable ways as you can see in this picture and hence we should be picking up uh, by uh, not only attempt for the correct placement, but various tools and techniques. And if you see that uh, the various uh, tools and techniques has been used and based on this, uh, the, the, the algorithm has been developed uh, by uh, Van Jundert, wherein they have given a stepwise approach to look for various malpositions that I have just showed that so that we can use this uh, uh, supragotic airway devices safely into the clinical practice. The newer tools, as we know that uh, the correct placement is primarily based on clinical test, which is chest expansion, audible leak, leak as assessed uh, by the newer anesthesia workstations. And we need to look for uh, the placement using these clinical devices, but these are having a lot of limitations. They are not a visualized technique. They do not detect anatomical malposition, which we have just shown in the pictures. Yeah. And they, this seemed acceptable place on clinical tests eventually appeared to be unacceptably when the other techniques of its correct placement like use of the fiber optic scopes or endoscopes were used and almost half of them uh, were shown to be having uh, malplaced and, and uh, the, the earlier versions uh, where uh, we were not able to assess them properly uh, probably leads to more airway complication and hence earlier days they were limited use but now when we use the other uh, tools like including the fiber optic bronchoscopy has its role and more recently uh, this uh, this tools has allowed us to look for these malpositions but again uh, uh, when we need to look for uh, we need to look for all those features which is uh, uh, indicating of uh, not correct placement of supragotic airway devices. And then we were looking for more uh, other uh, bedside tools and ultrasound as uh, has come into clinical practice of anesthesiologists being used at various modalities. It has found role in the use of uh, the uh, placement of angel mask also. 
And when we use the ultrasonography, uh, this is an interesting study where they have uh, no, looked for the correct placement. And uh, in this, just three standard image planes are confirmatory of the correct placement of the endotechial tube. Now, this is a transverse plane. Uh, you can see in this diagram, the probe is uh, put in a transverse plane, the curvilinear probe between the hyoid bone and the thyroid bone. And you can see that two symmetrical cuffs can be seen across the midline, which indicates the correct placement. You can also see the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the placement should be appropriate tip in the esophagus and uh, similarly can be seen when you place this probe on the suprasonal notch and you can see the correct placement uh, of the tip of the supraglottical devices and confirm that this is not uh, in a misplaced position. So this requires a, a transfer screen at the uh, literal side of the suprasonal notch and uh, when that when the cuff is not there you can see that uh, the esophagus appears like this structure on the ultrasonographic image but it will transform into the cuff tip it man manifests almost as a round shadow uh, once the tip of the supraglottic devices uh, is put on the upper uh, uh, margin of the esophagus upper end of the esophagus and this change you can easily observe which indicates the correct placement of supraglottic airway devices the third picture, uh, you can see the alignment. Uh, this is acquired from the second one, uh, wherein uh, the in second image that I just described in the is in the uh, transverse position. Here, and you rotate uh, the probe in the uh, same plane by 90 degree while keeping the esophagus in the center of the image, allowing the parasitic plane of pharynx and the larynx. And here, you can see if you see this structure, this. Uh, uh, shadow of the cuff like snake heads and the sagittal plane of the esophagus confirms that the tip is placed in the correct position. And hence, once it's confirmed, you can ensure that your cuff is right. And uh, for whatever surgical procedures are you being used, its safety will be ensured if uh, uh, the placement is correct. The various gynecological surgical procedures, uh, the, even the ultrasound has been found to be used, and uh, it has been seen that. Uh, the placement uh, of these devices can be very safely confirmed and uses even in these surgical procedures. This is an interesting uh, uh, review article that we published and we have uh, confirmed uh, this various published literature where they have found the use of uh, ultrasonography for the correct placement and can be repeatedly used uh, during the surgical procedure. Even in the before extubation, we can confirm once again that it is correctly placed. And hence, probably it appears that uh, the ultrasound will found its role for correct placement, increasing the safety of device, increasing the arena of the evolved LMAs into this. So this means the future uh, devices, uh, in future, the supraglottic devices remains one of the important modality along with its uh, uh, use of ultrasonography so that they can be used uh, for various clinical procedures. So to conclude, uh, uh, the various supraglottic devices that are available, we need to the appropriate uh, device, uh, understand the limitation of a device in a particular clinical scenario so that we can use them safely. Prepare, check your equipment well, practice first and then use it, especially in difficult cases. Uh, learn to identify correct placement and uh, try to identify various malpositions that can happen because that will increase the adverse events, whatever the surgery is being done. Do monitor the curve pressures. And when we are talking for various non various newer indications like it's used in obese patients, pregnant patients, prone patients, CPR, we should be a little cautious for whatever the um, whatever the uh, important points we have shown you for its correct placement for its correct uses. That needs to be ensured so that we can use them uneventfully. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh, for that enlightening lecture. Um, so I'll uh, we go through to the last lecture. I'll try to do it in 10 minutes. Okay. So um, uh, last uh, one and a half hours, we have heard about a lot of developments. But uh, one uh, particular development was a, a bit different. That's why we thought we'll give another a, a separate 10 minutes because this is an LMA specifically designed to do endoscopy. So we all know that 
the sedation for apogee endoscopy are associated with a lot of challenges there are aesthetic challenges like shared airway limited access to the airway the position in which they do the procedure and the chance of airway obstruction be it be the teeth or the uh, tongue getting pushed back by the bite block or the endoscope there are a uh, lot of patient factors because nowadays the patients which you get in the endoscopy suit are uh, quite old or uh, the extremes of the age um, and they have significant comorbidities and sometimes you are forced to give a bit of deep sedation to suppress the gag reflex and the uh, with the obesity pandemic a lot of these patients have sleep apnea and uh, the incidence of hypoxia or laryngospasm if you are not careful can be a bit difficult in the no, non operating room settings uh, among the environmental factors first and foremost is the uh, concerns of non operating room anesthesia and uh, the surgeon is sharing the airway especially when you are talking about an er cp scope and eu scope they are larger in diameter and if you are going to use uh, uh, oxygen uh, delivery using a nasal cannula you people have uh, increased the flows to 6 liters 10 liters but we need to understand that you will produce a significant amount of mucosal drying and produce a pistaxis if you are using an unhumidified flows try we say good option but again uh, yes the cost and the availability are still issues especially in india so when you talk about the airway management during endoscopy we need to understand that hypoxemia i will say that it is quite under reported and if you look at the literature it's about 10 to 50 percentage the 50 percentage is, is huge and when you have hypoxemia in at high risk patients it can produce cardio pulmonary complications and these are in the range of 5 to 10 cases in about 1000 endoscopies so uh, you talk about overall adverse events it's like 1 in 100 these are mostly from american uh, 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 studies and if you look at the uh, patient safety federation anesthesia patient safety federation vision uh, in 2020 that no patient shall be harmed by anesthesia this is probably time for us to think about a special uh, device okay which will provide the comfort and safety separate endoscopic channel preferably and you should be able to monitor oxygenation and etco2 and uh, you should have very less complications and offer rapid recovery so if you look at this particular device which is called lma gastro which is introduced by teleflex uh, is a great device so you can see that there's a clear uh, airway uh, tube and it has got a separate endoscopic channel so uh, this fits in beautifully uh, um, as a great safety device in the LM, uh, g endoscopy suit because you have uh, a separate channel which you can connect and monitor the uh, give anesthesia monitor carbon dioxide there is uh, oxygenation no issues with oxygenation and um, uh, the anesthetic uh, stability and uh, because uh, there is a separate channel uh, the chance of aspiration and uh um, complications are very less and because the material is silicon uh, which has got a separate cuff press technology like dr rakesh has said that it is probably time for us to think about over pressure rather than volumes because uh, conventionally we put in uh, a recommended amount of volume irrespective of the patient's uh, or uh, or the space uh, pharyngeal space so uh, on an average the cuff pressure if you use with a cuff pressure monitor is about 60 or 70 so this will allow you to keep the cuff pressure above about 40 that is the green zone of the cuff pilot technology so you can see that this has an integrated bite block it has got an airway channel it has got a gastroscopic channel and it has got a adjustable holder okay this adjustable holder can be fixed to any of these grooves along the bite block okay so because two patients are the same and uh, this can be uh, locked in a position which is unique to that individual patient okay and as i said earlier this uh, we don't blindly put in uh, 20 ml in a 3 size lma we need to uh, titrate the volume to get the uh, cuff pressure into the green zone this black mark is sitting in the green zone okay so uh, the insertion technique is not different the sizing is also not different just go according to the standard size selection okay so if you look at the evidence there is uh, uh, the use has been substantiated by 
studies, but you can see that none of these studies are randomized control studies. Okay. So we have started uh, doing a study in CMC Valor. We finished about 40, 50 cases. And um, this data was about two months back. So um, we have done uh, gastroscopies, uh, about 25 gastroscopy and uh, some ERCTs and uh, bandings. Okay, so if you look at the intro malpositions, incidence is very less uh, or practically in little. Uh, none of our patients desaturated and the recovery times also were beautiful. Anesthesia was left to the uh, surgeon's uh, anesthetic discretion. It can be TIVA or inhalation. So when you look at the overall insertion success rate, I'm talking about the LMA, it's quite good. The first attempt success was also quite good because we uh, allowed uh, both our senior residents and uh, postgraduates to do it, but still the, it is quite good as any second generation LMA. If you try to pass the endoscope, the first attempt success with the gastroscope was 100%, while with the ERCP scope, it is slightly low, 93%. I will explain to you why. So um, the indications are any patient who is at a high risk and comes for an endoscopy can be anesthetized by LMA gastro. The contraindications are if you have radiotherapy to the neck or hypopharynx because it is a pre-shaped LMA. The patients with inadequate mouth opening, patients with emergency surgery or decreased pulmonary complaint are related contraindications. So uh, certain practical tips. So ideally, this uh, channel has to be lubricated with a medical grade silicon. But in many of uh, the hospitals in India, we don't have medical grade silicon. So either you use it a water-based lubricant or a lignocaine viscous. The problem of using a water-based lubricant is you have when you move silicon against silicon, that I'm talking about the endoscope outer coat, you can have a bit of airway resistance. Okay. So I just want you to just focus on this part. This is the um, uh, um, uh, a flap. So you can pass it through this connector and you can uh, uh, fix it. You can see that there are serrated margins. You can fix it so that the LMA doesn't move once it is kept in position. Okay, the insertion technique, I will not go into the details because of the lack of time. Okay, so when the patient uh, or the LMA is, uh, we have inserted the LMA and LMA is in correct position, uh, the holder has to be flush against the patient lips but not compressing it and once you are sure about the position it can be locked to any of these uh, grooves on the bite block okay and the, it comes with a, a beautiful fixing tape it can be fixed so the beauty of this fixing device is that the lma doesn't move along with the uh, uh, movement because otherwise when you're going to put an ERCP scope or a us scope you are always worried about the movement of LMA. So with our experience, we have seen that LMA movement and malpositions are quite less. So uh, this is something which we will discuss during the discussion time, uh, whether we should think about volumes or pressure. So I will not go into it at the moment. So um, because of the lack of time, I will just skip through uh, certain of this part. And I will go to the um, endoscope insertion. Okay. So what we need to understand is um, when you're planning to do a gastroscope, you can see that the gastro this channel is about 14 millimeter and gastroscope diameter is nine millimeter and it has got a tip camera. But if you're going to use a, a EUS scope, you can see that it has got a 13 millimeter scope and it is practically filling the lumen. So again, similarly with the ERCP scope, it's quite big compared to the gastroscope and it has got a side facing camera. So both these have side facing camera. So I'll explain why it is important. So if you're going to look at the vision, okay, I'll stop here. Okay. So if you uh, look at the uh, LMA gastro, it was a circular opening, but because this patient was probably a bit smaller and this soft material gets compressed and becomes oval, okay? So if you put too much air into this cup, or if you are wrongly sized the LMA, this lumen is the one which is going to get compromised. So the, uh, it's nicely lubricated. You can see that the tip of the LMA is sitting at the upper esophageal sphincter and you are straight away going in. But if you're using the same gastroscope and if you're going to put a um, uh, esophageal banding device, okay, then the diameter is a bit more. Okay, It is almost like 13 millimeter. So if you're trying to pass it, 
uh, here what is happening is my uh, endoscopic colleague told me that there's a bit of resistance okay so what we did was we momentarily deflated the cuff okay when you deflated the cuff his passage was very easy and he could pass it and then the uh, uh, we could reinflate and the procedure was uneventful but when you do an ERCP scope the things are slightly different when you're doing a side facing camera normally the endoscopist will start seeing the back of the tongue then he will start seeing the uh, part of the teeth and uh, arytenoid uh, and uh, he has certain anatomy and this endoscopist or the gastroenterologist are not uh, told not or taught not to uh, push against resistance okay so uh, i'll show you uh, the difference uh, between a gastroscope and an ear so if you look at the gastroscope even on a mannequin this passes beautifully without any resistance okay but if you're going to use an ERCP scope, uh, you can see that, um, so with the gastroscope, uh, the moment you are in, you, uh, you are seeing the entire process of insertion. Okay, but when you're talking about an ERCP scope, please understand the difference. So again, it has got a, an anterior facing uh, camera. So here, because the scope is in position, the endoscopist is seeing only blue. He's not seeing the back of the tongue he's not seeing the arytenoid vocal cord. So he's missing out on his normal landmark. Even though it is passing in beautifully, he is not seeing his normal landmark and they are taught not to push against resistance. So the most important thing here is uh, let him pass uh, his EUS scope or an ERCP scope through, his, through this channel and understand the normal resistance because of the device. Okay, and once he and let him do a lot of gastroscopies first, then uh, make him do ERCPs through this. Because once he's comfortable and knows that okay, this is bang on top of the upper esophageal sphincter, they'll be comfortable to do it. So that is what we did. So here, what we are trying to deliberately overinflate and get the cuff to about uh, 70 centimeter pressure. So then we are trying to introduce the uh, ERCP scope. So you can see that the ERCP score which went in comfortably in the first attempt you can see it's not going there is resistance okay that is because the uh, inflated cuff is pressing onto the uh, um, gas endoscope channel so uh, the, for the uh, successful placement uh, of LMA gastro we have already gone through the tips so the practical tips advice for success uh, in the endoscopy room the trust of the endoscopist is, endoscopist is crucial uh, they are taught not to push against the resistance. So you should probably start with a lot of gastroscopy first till they are comfortable and um, then move on to the uoscopy and the uh, EUS. A good lubrication is the key and you can temporarily deflate the cuff before uh, you do ERCPs. Okay, so I'll stop my uh, presentation here. Uh, so before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Radhakrishnan and Dr. Sanish, I have couple of questions uh, for uh, the panelists or other speakers. Um, uh, Dr. Tejas, uh, if you are um, going to introduce uh, a laryngeal mask, do you prefer to put it, introduce it um, with propofol alone or an induction agent alone or you prefer to give a small dose of relaxing? Most common thing is propofol alone. Uh, but okay. if you are having difficulty, then um, just go through the difficult error algorithm. That's what it, and 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 a, one of the things that is mentioned, uh, which is a more a more recent change, is that when you have difficult ventilation, relaxation is recommended. Okay. Uh, what is your opinion, uh, Dr. Rakesh? Because uh, if you look at the literature uh, and you have emphasized the importance of adequate uh, depth of anesthesia. Um, so if you are, the patient is in a slightly lighter plane, the LMA placement can be a, a bit of problem. So what do you, what is your opinion? Sir, I, I think I fully agree uh, because if you have good depth of anesthesia placement will be good. So I think uh, giving sufficient time, whether you are doing an inhalation induction or a intravenous propofol based induction, give a sufficient time to go ahead and put the LMAs. But uh, we also need to remember that in case if you are using these LMA device as a rescue method, because these are a part of uh, various uh, 
uh, algorithmic approach uh, along various difficult airway guidelines. In those situations, placement of LMS should be uh, facilitated by the use of neuromuscular blocking agents because yeah. it has been seen and there, there are numerous data. So we cannot say that one is better over the other or one is the definite technique, but then based on the uh, first attempt experience, uh, we can take uh, the second chance that how our second chance should be. Just to remember, uh, various uh, guidelines mention that the insertion of uh, LMAs, if the first is failure, there should be some change in the second attempt, whether the position, whether the equipment or the patient related things, which includes the use of uh, neuromuscular blocking agents or the depth of anesthesia. So I think this will be a sequel of uh, steps that needs to be taken care when we are inserting the LMAs or supraglottic AV devices. Thank you. Uh, I have got a couple more questions. If you are, uh, I'll ask uh, Tejas first because Dr. Rakesh is uh, primarily, even though he's an expert in everything, but he's primarily an onco anesthetist. So uh, uh, Tejas, in the UK uh, scenario, if you have a failed obstetric uh, intubation, uh, which will be your preferred LMA? Will you try to change the LMA to a, an intubation or will you prefer to uh, manage the case with a uh, laryngeal mask airway if you have managed to put in a second generation element. Uh, okay, I can't quote the precise algorithm because I <laughs> haven't seen it yesterday. Like um, if, uh, my personal choice, uh, it would be a second generation LMA. Uh, and, and again, it depends on what, if, for example. The reason I ask for us, because UK does a lot of uh, uh, means uh, uh, general anesthesia for obstetrics. Not really no, a lot. No, there no, is no. some, but uh, majority is still spinal. Uh, okay. 95, 98% probably spinal. Um, I, I mean, I haven't been doing obstetrics in the UK. Um, but uh, just a couple of points. One, it has to be a second generation. Secondly, uh, not all hospitals have all uh, supraglottic airway devices. So in, in our place, for example, IGEL is the go-to device. And then we have Oregon. Uh, if you want a different kind of device. So uh, for this uh, here, I would probably pick an Oregon over IGEL. Uh, maybe it, uh, in obstetrics, but I haven't, no, this is not a situation I've actually been in. Uh, but you will definitely yeah. put a second generation in a good seal. Hey, Rakesh, what is your uh, take on it? I think uh, uh, Dr. Tejas and Dr. Raj, you're the better person because I'm not doing okay. obstetric for the last 10 years, so I may not be the right person. I think you can take, uh, you can give your input, sir. Yeah, I will agree with uh, uh, Dr. Tejas on that. Uh, I think uh, you should use a device which you are familiar with, but if uh, I think it all depends on um, the urgency of surgery and also uh, how good or how fast is your occupation. Uh, so then uh, you can decide whether you want to change it to an endotracheal tube or you want to continue with a second generation. But personally speaking, I'll, if I have a well-seated uh, second generation LMA, uh, I'll uh, prefer to do the case under that rather than changing it to an endotracheal tube. Maybe if I have expertise and a video laryngoscope or something, I would uh, do a second chance. But I'll go according to the uh, DAS or a IDA obstetric algorithm. I think that is the safest way to go. Rakesh, uh, this I think question if, is for if you. you talk have... of... Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, if you talk you about the evidence, told... I think second generation devices are quite safe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when you talked about uh, obesity, the first controversy, you mentioned very clearly that if somebody's BMI is very more than 35, or if you are going to do a laparoscopic surgery or a surgery in lithotomy, or uh, if you expecting the surgical duration to be more than 90 minutes, then prefer not to use a laryngeal mask airway. So uh, is this 90 minutes because of the complications associated with LMA, like um, uh, uh, the uh, nerve injuries, sore throat, or is it an arbitrary number? Like the next uh, scenario you gave was an ENT surgery. Some of this ENT surgery, like mass sweat, some peak surgeons may take four hours. So can we put an LMA and do the case? Uh, or uh, is it uh, because the surgical duration is expected to be more than 90, you should be using a 
uh, in the tracheal tube. So I think I will put it uh, this way. And uh, in the last session of yours, you very nicely put up uh, that just know the uh, anesthesia is it will be the trust and the comfort of the surgical colleagues also because you are working as a team. So as I always say for these type of devices, uh, we should not be attempting uh, any type of this device for the first time when the surgeon is not comfortable. And also, until uh, we and we give, uh, I can say, an uh, optimal surgical patient, we can proceed with. But as a general routine, uh, taking this as a webinar and uh, all the of uh, friends will be listening to us, uh, the safety is important and the experience is the additional part of it. So I think whether we talk of the ENT surgical procedures or the uh, obese procedures, Yes, or uh, maybe sometimes some people are, uh, or some evidence is coming up with the prone procedure also. If you are comfortable with, and if you are doing it routinely, you then it's okay. Then you can even extend or stretch a little bit of it. But then remember the limitations of it and try to pick up any limitation or complication that are happening before it happens. And that comes with experience. Same thing will be happening for the intensive surgical procedures. You can go ahead and do it. People are doing it. Uh, tonsillectomy is done, being done, and there are a lot of literature. But then you should be a little comfortable. The surgeon should be comfortable, and you should ensure uh, that the fit of these devices are appropriate. When we talk about the clinical placement, there are a lot of issues. Though the ventilation may be appropriate, with, even with a malplaced second generation device. But if you look with the other modalities, uh, especially when I mentioned about the fiber optic assessment or the ultrasound assessment, there'll be a lot of um, you know, malplacement of these devices and that will increase the risk of complications. So hence, we should be very comfortable. Uh, as you said, the endoscopist never uh, push against resistance. Similarly, we should also be thinking that we are not pushing the uh, any supraglottic device inside against resistance or if it is not placed correctly and we can allow this as you do. We should be cautious. If we are taking it, we can connection in my uh, session. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, before I hand over to Dr. Aravishan, sir, uh, I'll have one last question to Dr. Tejas. Uh, now, uh, there is a lot of emphasis uh, or evidence coming that we should not be uh, blindly putting uh, the volumes. Uh, we, we, rather than the volumes, uh, we should be talking about the cuff pressure. What is your take? Pressure is important. Um, also, the position is important. If, if, for example, you have a twisted LMA, you're likely to achieve a much higher pressure with a much lower volume. Um, so correct positioning and appropriate pressure, they have to go together. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's, it, it cannot be blindly one fixed volume. I agree that pressure is an important consideration. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Tejas and Dr. Gag. Over to you, sir. Uh, sorry, we have exceeded by eight minutes. Thank you, Raj, Tejas, and Rahesh. Before we conclude, one or two small doubts. Do you think it is ethical in an obese patient to put a patient on prone under an LMA? Do you think it is ethical in an obese patient to place an LMA and do the work? So there are, there are two things here. One is uh, whether we should go ahead and get the prone position in uh, a prone position in obese patient for surgical procedure. Uh, second aspect is uh, we also need to look for what type of surgical procedure are they going up and what are the other status, the respiratory status and all those things. And the third is the experience, experience of the anesthesiologist and experience of the, uh, the, the operating surgeon also. So I will not say that is 100% safe uh, even for the second generation devices uh, to be uh, inserted into a obese patient for a surgery in prone position. One has to have good experience for it, and uh, preferably, if you don't have experience, I will. I would suggest here that now, you know, for a, experience a definitely way way, which is more comfortable. Experience is an entirely different thing. What I'm saying is that do you think is it fifty percent safe to put an LMA and place the obese patient prone? Do you think so? And again, as you said that. We well, cannot, experience, because, uh, may be, experience may be keeping the patient for nearly four hours with an LMA. Well, I really don't think beyond 90 minutes is it wise 
to keep a patient under LMA, especially for a surgery of the head and neck? Do you think so? Yes, uh, if you ask Beyond me personally, minutes, because, uh, minutes uh, to keep the patient is... under LMA. Can I can I just take my take? Yeah, please. There is no uh, one arbitrary time cutoff. When LMAs were first introduced, people no hardly there were less than five percent of LMA use was over two hours. This was in a paper in the nineties, and if you look at literature, two thousand seventeen, there is a paper where they are using LMA, LMAs for procedures of eleven hours. And and in our practice here, routinely, we never consider how long it is going to take, but other factors. Now, if you are looking at obese patient, obese patient plus gynecology, plus head down position, uh, plus laparoscopy, you know, you're adding too many things. Uh, yeah. and, and therefore, that risk assessment has to come in. If, it, if my orthopedic surgeon wants to do a knee replacement or something, and it's going to take a bit of time, it's a bit complex, and he's going to take five hours, I'm still fine with it. Even if the BMI was 35, I would still be okay with it because I could have a bit of head up position. Unlikely that the LMA is going to twist and move during these five hours because surgery is way away from it. Other risk factors are being reduced. So I think it's not it's difficult to put only one number. You'll have to put the entire thing into context um, to be able to decide well, what's the best appropriate technique. But but LMAs or superglottic airways for two or three hour procedures is routine here. Three, four even uh, is very commonly done over here. People don't think twice about it. Yeah, three, four hours. Yeah, good. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. There are Dr. Jayashree, in the chat, yeah. yeah, sorry. Dr. Jayashree, will you want to make any comments? So there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Yeah, please, so clear, it please clear it up. Please clear Yeah. So what position uh, of patient was used with the uh, in the gastroscopy suit? So most of the cases we tried, uh, we did it in the lateral position or semi-prone. And what we have done cases in the prone position also. Uh, so we didn't have any problem with that. The next question is that will fluxometallic tube replace the intubating LMA tube? Uh, I will say no. Yeah, because it is designed uh, uh, and the, the uh, it's not the only the flexometallic component. It has got a separate two-he shaped tip. So if you're using any other tube, it's better to use uh, over a fiber optic bronchoscope. Is there a minimum age uh, for the uh, LMA insertion? Uh, I will say no. Uh, there is enough and more literature uh, on uh, right from neonate size one LMA is available uh, even during neonatal resuscitation. The chance of our uh, successful outcome is quite good with LMAs. And if you have an inexperienced neonatologist or an anesthetist, it's better to use an LMA. There is enough evidence for that as with CPR. Yeah, I think that uh, we cleared it. I think one box. point is important, which you uh, mentioned, uh, sir, that uh, when you're inserting tube through second generation devices, I think that blind error has gone away now. So it has to be a, a you know, visualized technique and preferably a fiber optic technique. And that is the recommendation for majority of guidelines. Good. Any more questions, sir? Um, nothing in the chat box, sir. Yeah. Well, it's open for everybody. Anybody wants to clarify anything? Special thanks to Rakesh uh, for joining from Leh. Yeah. It's on an official <laughs> duty to Leh. Thank you. Thank you for Rakesh joining from high altitudes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Also. Pages from <laughs> good, good. High altitude. Pages from other yeah. part of the world. Uh, and so thanks for uh, joining. Pages. They just to join from the coldest place in the. <laughs> yeah, good. Anyway, it was a very wonderful session. You are answered most of the doubts. And uh, you were able to give vast knowledge on the use of LMAs and uh, how it can be used properly. And uh, we are all thankful to you for this wonderful session because I never heard in my lifetime so far such a detailed lecture on LMAs and all the possible adaptations of LMA and how far it could be used. I'm so thankful to the knowledge given to me. 
and i thank you all on behalf of the indian college of anesthesiology in being with us and explaining in detail about the lma supraglottic airways and the future of lma is in the supraglottic airways thank you wish you all good night thank you good night thank you dr balna thank you thanks dr balna thank, thank you sir. sir thank you thank you sir and thank you dr ras sir thank you so much I think Debelna has gone to sleep. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for floating. <laughs> okay, thank you, Debelna. Yeah, bye, sir. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Debelna.